wisdom attend, let us hear the Holy Gospel. Peace be to all. To thy spirit. The reading of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to thee, O Let us attend. At that time Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee. He saw to others, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them immediately. They left the boat and their father and followed him. And he went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every infirmity among the people. Glory to the O Lord, glory to This is a very busy day. Uh, and uh, youth events uh, to meet one another as we've been doing. I'll be attending the Parish Life Conference this Tuesday through Friday in Tucson, Arizona, where it's 109 degrees. But thanks to God, we meet in air-conditioned comfort. Um, we have a lot going on, especially in preparation for the consecration in the next few months. The time will pass quickly, so I would suggest that you get your reservation as soon as possible, since we have a limited seating capacity, as well as consider sponsorship for the uh, commemorative journal of our new church. I walked in the church the other day, I said to myself, I can't believe this is done actually done you know we have fulfilled the dream of our founders who of course will be honoring uh, as well as our benefactors who made uh, this dream possible um, of the 70 or so founders there's probably maybe nine still living and so um, it behooves us to honor them Back in the day when uh, giving to the church, the American dollar was not what it is today. But we thank God that we have no commercial loan, no debt, and hope to remain that way. So your commitment in supporting the church, not only in its construction, but maintenance. You know, hospitals and universities are built with no problem but they have a deficit in their maintenance, like churches. <laughs> so let's keep our commitments in providing the church with what we need and can possibly give. Uh, this coming month, I will begin receiving Social Security, which means there's more money to give to the church so that I don't have to pay one-third in taxes of the income that's going to come uh, at the end of the year. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Christ is in our midst. He is in our midst. 
today following the Feast of Pentecost, which was last Sunday and yesterday, the leave or the conclusion of the Feast of Pentecost, today we commemorate all saints who have lived since the beginning of time. And in the Western Church, All Saints Day is on the 1st of November, which is called All Hallows' Eve and I'm sorry, the 31st, which is Halloween. Uh, but for we Orthodox, the Sunday for all saints follows the Feast of Pentecost because its connection to the feast that celebrates the descent of the Holy Spirit. And it was in Antioch, our mother church, where all saints began as a commemoration of martyrs in the fourth century. So this has a particular meaning to us. And yesterday, we celebrated the feast of Peter and Paul, our founders of the Antiochian church, of course, founded by Peter, but Paul who began his missionary journey from Antioch with John Paul and of course with Timothy going west. And today we commemorate all of the holy apostles that are the 12. You know, when we do memorials, it begins with the hymn that says, with the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And so our celebration is with all who love God, and whose heart is ready and willing to serve him, all who are called agios, holy, holy, which means saint. If you look at an icon and it's in Greek, the word agios, Dimitrios, agios, gorgios, means saint, holy George, holy Demetrius. They are whose lives are for us the models and examples of faith and love and who have demonstrated Christian virtue. So what do we know about them from God's perspective? Well, last night in the reading from Solomon, we heard the following, the souls of the righteous are in the hands of God and there shall no torment touch them and in the sight of the unwise, they seem to die, and their departure is taken for misery, and they're going from us to be utter destruction, but they are at peace. Solomon 3.1. The righteous live forever, and their reward is the Lord, and the care of them is with the Most High. Therefore, they shall receive the kingdom of majesty and the crown of comeliness from the Lord's hand, for with his right hand shall he cover them, and with his arm shall he protect them. And with the children, at the children's sermon, I'll be talking to them about these saints. What does it mean to be righteous? Who are righteous? Are you and I called to be righteous? Do you know what that means? The Bible says the righteous are those who walk in truth. They don't build their life on lies. And they are unafraid of the truth. They are the just, whose pleasure is doing good, whose focus is upon what is true, honest, pure, just, lovely, of good report, virtuous things or what merits praise, Philippians 4, 8. Who fears God, not evil. Repeat, who fears God, not evil. Because if you have God in your life, the demons vanish. It's like light. The darkness vanishes. Who prays, and has a culture of prayer. I like that phrase. I learned it from Metropolitan Saba. And if you go to the web, go to the website, go to the bulletin for this Sunday. Click in English or Arabic. You will hear his teaching on a culture of 
prayer. It's worth reading. The saints who are righteous are kind, merciful, forgiving, long-suffering. They are humble and meek. Meek does not mean weak. <laughs> they are people of dignity. They are people of courage. They are people who are unashamed. Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man and woman, by the way, who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly or stands in the way of sinners or sits in the seat of the scornful, but who takes delight in the law of the Lord and meditates on it day and night. Who does not take the advice of the wicked and then in Hebrew, the word is, or loiters in the way that sinners take. <laughs> you know, we can entertain many things in our life and loiter in the wrong places. The basis and foundation of sainthood is that they were men and women who were repentant sinners. No different to you and I, and what we are called to be. Mother Victoria, years ago, when she spoke to us, said, you know, there isn't a life of the saint that concludes with the words, and they lived happily ever after. <laughs> and as I mentioned yesterday in my message, the Bible says, all who live godly in Christ will suffer <clears throat> persecution. And it's because of the threats or evil that is in our world that it is important for us to know that we who believe bear the light of truth upon the darkness of evil and must be steadfast in our hope in Christ. Finally, a good Christian witness is someone with personal discipline whose lifestyle has a framework and structure with boundaries. You know, freedom is not the end justifies the means. You can do whatever you want and get whatever you want, however you want, even though the freedom in this country enables us to do just that. The Christian doesn't govern his life that way. The disciplines of the Christian includes prayer, fasting, attending church, not neglecting the sacraments, repentance, just to name a few. And so should you and I regard these as mere rituals, they're only part of our family heritage and culture, or view them as the ornaments of our faith. You know, coming to church is where you are hatched, matched, and dispatched. <laughs> when you have a baby and you baptize the child after being hatched. And then when you come back to be married, you are matched. And then when you come with your casket to be dispatched. Halas. <laughs> Haram. Haram. You know, this is not hocus-pocus. We have to venture into a deeper understanding of our tradition. And by the way, the word tradition, as I've been saying to the catechumens, is not just all the texts or the images. It's the Holy Spirit that enlivens the texts, that makes it relevant in our life, that makes it applicable to our life, that makes it pertinent to our life, through our life. That's tradition. It is the way we acquire spiritual power through the Spirit. Today, in our America, American way of life, we have a dominant national attitude towards religion. The value of our independent way of thinking has caused us to formulate being most comfortable in practicing our religion. I mean, thank God we have an air-conditioned church. There's not many that have this kind of benefit. 
And yet we still complain, oh, the seat is not comfortable, Father. Ya haram. We live in a kind of smorgasbord or buffet religion in America where we can pick and choose what we like and disregard the aspects of our tradition we don't like. It's happening. However, every baptized Christian who bears God's spirit will face challenges. And we cannot be men and women, husbands and wives, mothers and fathers who are complacent. We cannot remain as children content as in a wading pool. You know, as Sayyidina the Philip of blessed memory used to say, where we just splash and have a good time. Today's Christian must be courageous, devoted, fervent in prayer, and this kind of courage and devotion is not something that manifests itself without spiritual power. And that spiritual power is not manifested as in the ways of physical or political might. It requires being grounded in the knowledge of the truth, being steadfast and unshakable in faith, rooted in love, in able to have discernment by the Spirit in prayer. Christ is in our midst.